Thank you. So I've actually broke that talk into four different sections, so I apologise that it's not in three sections. So <laughs> stop, look, yeah. listen, think. Uh, the role of cartography and data communication. And the reason for this title was we thought that it best summarised what BGS has done over the past few years in developing its products and services. So this talk isn't actually going to give any foregone conclusions, but it's, it will show you some of the things that we've done and some of our findings are really common sense, but it's only when you've been doing things in such a way for such a long time that you have to actually stop, take a look at what you've done and realise what you need to do differently. Um, I'll just go on to the next one. And what we've done is, at the stop point, I'm going to take you back to 2009. At this point, this was where we realised that we needed to make our data more open. And we wanted to be an earlier adopter of this. And one of the first things we launched was Open Geoscience. Um, and this was the first time we'd made a lot of our data sets openly available. Um, the basis of the reuse and use of the data was what was set out under the Open Government Licence. And it was at a time when making our data openly available was quite big. Things such as the Freedom of Information Act, um, for example, um, and the environmental information regulations, all things that meant that we had to make our data more openly available. One way in which we did this was the launch of our web map viewer. Uh, the Geology of Britain viewer was one of these. And this was the first time that we'd made our 1 to 50,000 scale data openly accessible. Uh, at the time, this was quite a big worry for us because the 1 to 50,000 scale data had always been um, a flagship product of BGS as it had been developed alongside our range of printed 1 to 50,000 scale mapping. So to release it, we thought, actually, we're going to lose out on a revenue stream of licensing data to customers and sales of paper maps. In actual fact, what we found was that we could release this data with simplified attribution, although really comprehensive attribution, and that actually encouraged people to reuse it. And so actually, our worst fears were not actually realised. In fact, because it became so popular, we went on to a second phase of uh, what we could do with Open Geoscience. And we actually released um, the scanned copies of our 1 to 50,000 scale maps. The, so they're out there for people to use. And we looked at our other big data holdings as well, um, such as our borehole records, where we've got a total of over a million records available now for anybody to use and download. So it's, um, it's a big thing, making this data openly accessible. <coughs> and the way in which people interact with our data has also changed and we've been able to develop. For example, some of our apps that we've, we've developed, as well as our web map services and web feature services all different ways in which people can interact with our data. So Open Geoscience, it's really grown in popularity. On average, we have over 450,000 hits per month on um, the web map services. And over a million borehole scans per year are downloaded by the end users. But the problem we were facing was that since it started out, we weren't really sure who these end users were. And as it became more popular, we knew that this was of increasing importance. And back in, in the day, this was typically how a project would actually work. Um, and our stakeholder needs were really right at the end of the process. We put a lot of time and effort into developing an output, but they then had to think about what the stakeholder need actually was. And we ended up shoehorning a lot of our data and outputs and maps to meet that stakeholder need. So we realised at this point that the stakeholder needed to be involved throughout the actual whole process. So how was our data being used? Um, we've noticed that most planning reports and geological data that's been used, that usually sourced from an independent consultant, which is great, but not all of them. So a lot of these reports miss out geology altogether. The emergency services should also have access to our data. But we, often, we still get phone calls asking for advice on situations, for example, flooding. Um, our arsenic data was sensationalised as a toxic map of the southwest. Um, great. 
Uh, it probably didn't help ourselves very much with the fact that we actually delivered those maps looking like that. So that wasn't too good. So it's, we're still learning ourselves. However, this was misleading because you may or may not know, but most arsenic in soils uh, can be held and trapped inside there if there's iron oxides present. So it's very misleading. Oh, wrong button. Uh, our soluble rock data has also been used as an argument against housing development. And the media also play with the data as well. And this horrific looking map here, where they've deliberately used red and horrible big massive bullet points to be quite alarmist. Um, but, uh, so that doesn't help. Uh, but also furthermore, they've used the wrong data set. That actually isn't where the coverage of all the uh, soluble rock is. Um, our natural, yeah, see, our, our natural hazards maps are intended to help and inform planners and developers, not there to scaremonger and put, you know, create havoc. And that's there so you can enable them to make decisions on how to mitigate these issues. So they can build there with their eyes wide open knowing what's going on and budget accordingly so there's no horrible surprises. We also look at how other organisations represent visual data, especially those communicating potentially sensitive and um, uh, emotive information. For example, coastlines and erosion, coastal erosion. The Environment Agency have published an online portal for coastal, how, how it's managed. So this shows the management of the coastline. So these maps are designed to inform the viewer, avoiding any potential to be alarmist. There's also a demand for transparency. Now this, this can be difficult, this, this, this actually difficult for us because a lot of our data is licensed, um, but it does feed into a lot of our data, uh, other data sets. So one question for the cartographer is to advise the team, how can we actually deliver and show and be transparent about what data sets feed into here without infringing on license agreements, existing ones. So, how do we get round this? Well, a continued dialogue with all the relevant groups that, that are you know, believed to be out there that want to be interested in the geology. Oh, wrong one, it says it's up here, but it's not. There we go, those guys. So, talking and actually meeting people and getting out there from the very beginning of any ideas or project. A few years ago, we designed the UK Soil Observatory web portal to showcase data sets from various organisations as a drive to make open source data more accessible. Albeit an achievement, we, we believed it wasn't performing as well as it should. So we decided to revisit this and find out, well, we could see that maybe the more of a focus to the agricultural community would be better with the word soil in there at least. So, we held meetings with agronomists and demonstrations of the portal, uh, various events, and we staged a workshop with agronomists and farmers and the union and everything. And as a result of this, we discovered that the soil descriptions that we were giving were far too geological. Uh, there was also some mistrust in the visual quality of various data sets. For example, some data sets visualise boundaries crudely at different scales. So how do you cartographically get that trust back into, that, into those maps and those data? And also we found out that new data set ideas were also identified as well. So another thing is collaboration with local authorities and their planning departments. We revealed interesting issues regarding accuracy. For example, there was an issue regarding the relevance of a potential hazard. In this case, um, it's, it, it, it's actually the location of a hidden mine shaft. Should it be, in, it's inconsistently plotted on old maps uh, for, over, over the years. The cartographer had a pen, or whatever it was, and put the point there. Now the maps these days are, I mean, the, the mine shaft in this case was, was covered over and it was a desk-based study. You could go out there besides make quick equipment, but a quick, a quick uh, desk-based uh, in interrogation of this. So, the, this mine shaft had a zone of influence, and although it's always outside of the area of interest, which is yellow, uh, orange, that zone of influence did actually creep over. So there's this ethical issue of do we include this information or not? And I think yes, you should because you just don't know. It's an uncertainty, but so does these things that you have to consider as well. Um, communicating vulnerability of our coastlines are ongoing. Uh, 
Uh, people generally want to see clear boundaries showing lines of erosion over time. That is a wrong slide. So, uh, so hang, no, well, no, right, here we go. So, work, well, let's go there. So, yes, so people generally want to see clear boundaries, which is fine, but very scaremongery, not very good if you live there. That's really unnecessary. Uh, but the coastal management plan is to get around this by these, as we just briefly saw earlier, uh, all the information about holding the line and any, any administrative stuff and perhaps erosional predictions are all in the attributes. So it's not immediately horrific, you know, and there's no certainties of how far that erosion will be because man's intervention does tend to change things. So that's good. So it's more based on that. Um, back on here, going back again, working with the Nottinghamshire Local Resilience Forum, for example, revealed that maps really needed to be clear about issues and emergencies, uh, about regarding emergencies. They didn't want ambiguity, they didn't want to have uncertainty. Uh, for example, here, a landslide happens, where do I park the emergency vehicle? I don't want, you know, I want either a yes or a no. So the cartographer has to consider you know, the situation and the client's needs, if you like. Okay. So, another useful way of finding out how your data should be presented can be through staff secondment. And these are just some that I directly am aware of. Many lessons can be learned by housing a member of staff with these organisations. Learning what their needs are and how we could improve their access to our data. Thank you. Okay, so stakeholder delivery. So, one of the projects we've been working on is the development of a brownfield calculator. So we've been working with the local authorities um, in realising that brownfield sites are really important for housing redevelopment. But the authorities really want a, um, an actual cost applied to what, what the, each of their sites and what, what's the definite cost involved with the remediation and dealing with any contamination issues. Uh, one way in which we did this was to develop, to develop the Brownfield calculator by scoring the, the different sites and being able to present it as a final cost to the local authority based upon the so soil and groundwater con conditions and the soil and rock hazards. Um, by doing this, we were delivering to the stakeholder exactly what they required and it meant that they weren't having to interpret the geological data themselves. We'd already done that in presenting it in the GIS. Another output that they actually asked for was that they wanted paper maps um, of all their sites because it helped provoke discussion around the table when they were having their meetings within the local authorities themselves. Uh, a similar project was, that Clive has mentioned has been working with the emergency services and the need to have definite answers when attending an emergency situation. Um, for this, um, our initial visualisations were, were being presented as whether a hazard was likely or not. And then it could be drilled down into different attribute information, such as contamination and vehicle access. But it's only through speaking to the stakeholder we realised that different responders have different needs. So a category two responders, such as utility services um, and planners, for example, had more time to deal with the aftermath of an incident. And so we were able to repurpose our data in order to show the end user what they actually require. And we found that creating things like different fact sheets would actually help the end user in understanding the hazards um, that were present. So the cartographic skill really involved with both of these projects was that of data presentation and thinking about how data can be repurposed and presented in the way depending on the end user and how they're going to use the data. Keeping with the hazard theme, as Clive has mentioned, we have our GeoShore hazard data. Uh, one of the things with it is it's quite complex information. It's a categorised data set and it includes quite complicated phrases that require you to decipher what is actually going off. Uh, one of the things that we also found was that this sort of data is limited as to who could access it, either by people taking out an expensive GIS licence or by them by um, buying a re report through one of our resellers. So we found that there's a need for a national coverage map that would show the hazards clearly and show what trends were going off. 
But in order to do this, we couldn't simply just take our current data and present it on that scale of map. What we decided to do was to generalise the data using a series of hexagons to ensure that no small areas of hazardous data were lost and also to limit the amount of attributes that we had. So we had a low, moderate and significant hazard rating applied to these. And this meant that we were able to produce A4 size maps that could be released under Open Geoscience as well as access to the hexagon data itself. And the cartographic skill applied was that of generalisation, thinking how we can take that quite complicated data and present it, in, present it in a suitable way for the scale of the map. And that of visualisation, thinking how people would interpret the data as well. Uh, one of our other projects has been the development of a bedrock geology map of the UK and Ireland. And this came about because geology is becoming more of a focus within education itself. So we worked with the Earth Science Teachers Association, who held forums with local teachers, uh, teachers, not local teachers, teachers generally, that found that um, there was a requirement for an up-to-date geological map. But the scale of the map wasn't important. The most important factor was the actual size of the map. And it was essential that this map had to fit on a classroom door. So, but we had to think about other options available on this map as well, such as generalisation. Um, we had source of data from lots of different places and we had to think how it could be generalised appropriately to fit onto a single map sheet. And that of the end user as well, thinking of that child in the classroom who may be using this and ensuring that we used appropriate colours that could easily be interpreted on that single map sheet. It was only when we printed this map onto the single map sheet of paper that we realised we'd met that stakeholder need and we could then look at other products, such as the folded copy of the map and a geological jigsaw. So they all came after the initial stakeholder requirement was met. So the cartographic skill involved with this was quite high because it's a traditional cartographic product. But in particular, that of data presentation, thinking about how we're taking those different sources of data and generalising them in an appropriate way, and that of map function, thinking about that end user that's going to be using the map and how they need to interact with it and ensure that all the components are in the correct place, such as cross sections, for example. And finally, we had one of our minerals geologists come and speak to us about a report that they were writing um, based upon the mineral aggregates of England and Wales. Now, this report they showed us had lots of different data within it, but in particular, they were interested in these import and export maps that they've been producing for years about different min mineral commodities and where, the different, where they're being sent to within different regions of the England and Wales. Now they thought that because they had all this data, we could simply just put it into a web map viewer, which five years ago we'd have done without any further questions being asked. But we've realised now that we need to speak um, to the end user and think about what is required. So we had a meeting with the minerals team and looked at what their needs were and what the stakeholders' needs were as well. And it actually revealed that producing a web map would be the least favoured of all the options that we came up with. We didn't ha need to have a live dynamic stream of data. And as such, our outputs could be more cartographic based. So I think the lessons that we actually learned were, were that we could apply the different visualisation options based upon cartography but also that the engagement needs to start internally within the organisation before we can come up with any actual solutions and decide on a final one. We have to think about all the needs that are, that are there. So we've got to be quick now, I've got a minute. So making, right, making our data open source is an opportunity to help stimulate growth in the economy and build a stronger relationship with our stakeholders. But simply publishing information in its raw format proved to be prohibitive in its use. Um, stakeholder uh, engagement and the cartographer drives what we produce, not the other way around. We no longer assume that we know best. Visualisation of our output through stakeholder engagement will be pre present throughout the process, not just at the end. People generally want straightforward answers, but the cartographer needs to be aware that some information, thank you, uh, simply cannot be visualised by a simple line. Uh, and the cartographer has a moral obligation, like Makita going on here, to make sure that not only is the information clear to understand, but that it's also not misleading.
Uh, we have to remember as well that we're not creating fixed products anymore. Anything that we create is always going to need to be updated. So having that fixed endpoint isn't there as, a, as an option anymore for us. As a cartographer, we have to be comfortable with dealing with different ways of delivering data and maps. And as well as that, thinking about our current and future outputs and how people are going to want to access our data. The thing to remember as well is that we don't have all the answers. And certainly with us, we're learning on what, what we need to do. For example, our coastal project, where we're still looking at different options that we have available. Uh, this makes it more of a challenge for the cartographer, but at the same time, it presents us with more options and more, we're more able to use the skills that we have in a lot more different situations. There we are. Thank you. Time is pressing. We do have time for one or two questions if anyone wants to ask anything, please. They want food. <laughs> <laughs> Are you around the rest of the time? Yes. yes. Okay, if there are personal questions you want to ask, see the guys later. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.